Hey, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Now, we can see my slide deck. And moving through, disclaimers. So obviously these thoughts are my own and uh, they're not necessarily those of AMC. And uh, the products discussed are presented without prejudice or favour. They are really only for discussion purposes. So why does sampling matter? Well, obviously, as most of you realise, if you put shit in, you get shit out, no matter how you mine it. So, uh, you know, be aware of what you're putting into your model. And today I'll be focusing mainly on how you try to get the data uh, into the model in the best way you can. So in, in a time where lives matter across the world, well, jerk lives matter too. So that's why we need good sampling. Our, our code that we all report against uh, requires us to analyze and describe our sampling methods, our drill sample recovery, um, and our subsampling methods and analysis. So if we understand what's going in, we really need to see all of the detail. We need to see all of the understanding about what's going on. So what do we sample? Well, we sample everything. We sample rock chips, we sample soils, we sample drill cuttings, we sample stream sediment samples, we sample diamond core, and of course we sample all the end product stuff as well. Once it goes through the mill, we're sampling head feed, we're sampling uh, cyclone overflow, we're sampling the tails, because all of these things feed in or feed back to our models of, uh, of how we are doing or how we hope to be able to do it. And sampling in all of these situations is critical to ensure that you get it right. So how much should I sample is always the question that's asked. You know, well, as with most things in geology, it depends. Uh, obviously, if you're sampling um, an iron ore deposit where it's 50 plus percent iron, how you sample it matters, but perhaps not quite as much as something that's going less than a gram per tonne of gold. I mean, you're proportionally dealing with a much, much smaller proportion of the rock mass containing the elements of interest. So you really need to uh, understand your deposit and understand your grade distribution. Now, we can use uh, the um, sampling variance methodology, the approaches that were reported by uh, uh, Pierre Guy all that time ago and, and followed up on very well by Dominique Francois Bongasson, my good friend, and Francis Pitard and various others. And that famous uh, sampling error formula that's there on the screen that everybody looks at and goes, what the fuck? So please don't be stressed by those things. The idea, it's, it's really pretty simple. If you've got a, a small, smaller fragment size, you'll end up with a lower risk of getting it wrong. If you've got a, a, sorry, a lower fragment size, if you've got a greater sample size, you're like more likely to get it right than wrong. So, but, but how do these sampling error things work? What are they and why are they important? Well, if we look at some of those errors, we have a whole raft of them and they are all important because they're all additive. Every error that is made in that sampling process is one that accumulates as you go through the process. So if you start with a bad sample, it's only going to get worse thereafter. So we've got different types of errors. We've got the fundamental sampling error, which is no matter how hard you try, the material is heterogeneous and you will not be able to sample it perfectly. And that's the, called the fundamental sampling error or FSC. Then you've got the more easy to understand ones which are your grouping and segregation errors, the GSEs. And they can be, uh, you know, a range of things relating to how the rock 
is uh, is maintain is the mineralization within the rock is is reporting. So uh, once rock is broken, you can have segregation errors. Um, obviously, within a cyclone system, you can have segregation errors within a, a stockpile if you're sampling stockpiles. So rock movement it works in different ways. The size of the particle impacts how it moves, and there's a whole day's lecture on how uh, material moves in segregation. Within a pulp packet, material moves. So, you know, just because you've got a pulp doesn't mean you've got an unsegregated material. You've got to take care of it and look after it. Um, then you've got incorrect sampling errors or your ISEs, and they're, they're a lot more easy to understand. Your delimitation, your extraction, your weighing errors, your preparation errors, they're all about what happens with the material when you're doing it. Are you missing out on some of the sample or are you getting external contamination? All of these things impact uh, the precision of your uh, sampling uh, protocols. Um, and then lastly, and not necessarily last and least, but uh, you know, your analytical error. And really, analytical error is around the type of equipment that you're uh, and the and the methodology you're using for your analysis uh, and the protocols that you have in place within your uh, analytical laboratory. You know, presumably, if you're in Australia, you're dealing with ISO accredited laboratories. You've got fairly solid understanding that they understand what those potential errors are around instrument drift, around dilution errors, around using all of those sorts of things. And there's, again, another day on understanding what sort of errors you can get within a laboratory. But they're relatively small compared to the fundamental sampling errors and the, uh, the grouping segregation and, and and uh, incorrect sampling errors. So how do we try to minimise these is really the question. And, and what are the potential impacts? So if we look at uh, the, the, uh, a, a study that was done a little while ago now uh, in 2014 by uh, some friends from, uh, from South Africa, they had a look at a, at a range of sampling systems across the industry. Um, and and looked at what potential uh, sampling errors uh, on their sampling systems that they could see, all the way from uh, you know expiration through mining broken ore, um, head grade bullion even, and laboratories. What sort of errors could you expect? It's a bit shocking when you look at it that you can get you know the, the averages of those errors. You know, or total errors up around the 90% in broken ore. So in other words, you've got a chance of being 100% either side of your assay. That's a bit of a concern. So you want to try and minimise that as much as you can, obviously, otherwise you're getting a whole lot of unknowns. So we we do have a system of uh, within our industry of you know measuring and understanding what our sampling errors are. And we use a range of mechanisms to do that. We use duplicates as one of the measures. And that can be RC duplicates, it can be half core duplicates, it can be crushed core duplicates, it can be pulp duplicates, um, and it could even be same digestion duplicates if you wish to. But in reality, the ones that give you the most information is doing a range of them across time. Um, these charts are a little bit hard to understand, but I'll try to explain them. They're from my very good friend, Richard Inglis, in, who works at Newmont in the US at the moment. And it, it just shows you if you measure the uh, error, the relative uh, variance of the duplicates between the different types of uh, sampling duplicates, you can show improvement in your precision, uh, sorry, in your accuracy, no, in your precision between field duplicates, coarse duplicates and pulp duplicates to arrive at a mechanism that gives you an overall sampling error. And taking these graphs as an example where you can see on the, if you look at the sort of between, let's say, let's just the, the mirror image either side, but if you look at the left hand side and compare the two graphs, you'll see that the, the, the theory, the blue line is, has a lower relative CV for the pulps compared to the field duplicates and 
if you look at the actual duplicate uh, difference, you can see that at those wider ranges of uh, uh, the uh, population, those small ends, you'll see that there is an improvement in the precision of those outliers. And that's what you want to catch, it's the outliers that make a difference in your populations. So if you can get the bulk of the population right and get your outliers closer together in terms of the precision, then you're going to be much better off in terms of your global resource estimate. All of these are just mechanisms that will help guide you as to the likely risk around your resource estimate and certainly many of the speakers today have talked about you know what is your resource risk and understanding how to measure it and how to apply it okay let's just have a little thing back to back to the field a little bit about sample reduction uh, you know that's what we do we're in the field we're taking rc samples we're taking rab samples how do we improve them you know we've got pictures Generally, when you're out in the field in exploration, you're taking rab samples, they're dumped on the ground, you take a spear or you take a tin cup or you take a boot and fill it and drink out of it, you know, whatever. It's, it's around trying to get the best sample you can because at the end of the day, that's what you're relying on. Now, splitters have changed over time, certainly in my era. Uh, you know, we started off with dumps on the ground or dumps into a bag from a, from a cyclone without any sophisticated cone splitters or anything like that. And more often than not, it was a, it was a, uh, a riffle splitter. Now, riffle splitters, if used correctly, can give you a reasonable uh, reduction uh, proportionally correctly. However, there are risks around them, depending on the material type. So we look at uh, these pictures here and say, well, what's the problem here? Well, we're dealing with a laterite profile. We're dealing with very soft clays. What happens is, is the guys dump the sample into the splitter, the soft material hit the back of the splitter and created these bridges across the, the back half of that splitter and it was like, oh, well, no longer do I have an equal probable chance of getting it into any of the riffles. They're going down one half and not the other. So the first bit might go in, but the latter part of that bucket wouldn't go in to those riffles. So it's, you have to be mindful all the time of how best to uh, keep your equipment clean, how best to make those samples work for you and give you the best result. Cone splitters, obviously, uh, old material, old technology now, but they weren't. They were they were relatively new through my era. And here's an example of one where um, a small rab rig was or echo rig was operating, and I was asked to go and have a look at it and and, and uh, cast my my BDIs over it. And on face value, you know, it's got a cyclone, it dumps down into a cone, and you've got a dual port reject and a sample port, and you think. Oh, well, maybe it's okay. But on closer detail, when you actually look at it, here in the, the material that's it's the bridge between the cone and the, so the cone and the uh, cyclone, they've got this butterfly valve. It's operated by an arm that's uh, on the outside of the cone and it splits it across and it's flat like this and then it goes dumps like that every time dumps it one way. So it's only ever going to hit half of the cone in the cone splitter. So you're never going to get a likely chance of it going into the sample port, which is down there hidden in the left-hand side of that cone, or the right-hand side, which is the reject chute. So not all cone splitters are cone splitters. You have to have correctly uh, built and managed cone splitters, and you always have to check and make sure that your drill rigs have these sorts of uh, devices that are appropriately maintained. Of course, at the other end of the scale of things, when you're trying to uh, sample, subsample, very large samples that are coming out of large diameter drill rigs. Um, here's a couple of pictures, one from, uh, from my days at Telfer where there was a, a new uh, splitter device being managed. Um, another one from, uh, from some of the commercial products, you know, they, they're trying to split down very large samples into small samples. And it's very, very difficult practically, mechanically to build these systems for them to generate a proportionally 
uh, accurate in weight and sample likelihood um, in those systems. In fact, these systems more often than not piss off the drillers and may magically get broken every time, uh, you know, every couple of days so that eventually they're so unproductive they get thrown away because the drillers don't like them because it takes time away from drilling holes if they're on a, uh, a metre bonus for uh, drilling holes on a production rig. So the systems, the products have to be built for purpose. Um, and reducing very large samples, there's really no easy way to do it. Um, and the old days of uh, sampling a blast hole cone, you can do it if you're very careful and you sample, you know, with very specific protocols and you understand what the risks are. Uh, it can be a, a potentially reasonable sample, but you have to do the test work to show that it is viable. So I'll just jump into uh, a little a video that I got off the web from uh, one of the providers. Um, I'll turn off the sound because the music's horrible, um, but I'll just zoom through to a bit because there's a bit in here that I think is quite interesting and it shows the nature of the way that samples are uh, introduced into a cyclone and the way that they should theoretically be sampled. So here we've got a rig drilling down through the ground, it's got RC rig uh, nature, the samples coming up the inner tube, going through the head and down into the, this, this sampling system. And the sample is then uh, obviously rotated and decreased in velocity. The sample is falling at the bottom and you notice it's rotating. The bottom of the cone is rotating to ensure that the sample remains mixed. It then goes through a drop box system into a second drop box system so that you can retain it in a calm environment and then it drops out through the sampling ports. Now, is this a perfect system? I don't know, but it's pretty good. It's pretty complex, it's pretty expensive, but it, it's a system that has been shown through studies to be reasonably good at giving you an equiprobable chance of getting the sample through into your sample bag compared to the bulk reject. So, We'll just skip away from that now, but the systems that you're taking in those sorts of environments, especially in a mining environment, they're so dependent on the nature of the material. You know, your, your ore body uh, might be very weathered and oxidised and it's sitting in amongst material that's hard as the hobs of. I've been to mines where they've done a great grade control system drilling and then the blast engineers manage to blow it all over the park and you can't constrain it. That's one issue where you're not worried about the sampling, you're worried about the blasting. In other situations, you've got damp and wet samples in the bottom of a pit where they're still trying to get the water out. All of these sorts of things impact the quality of the sample that you're getting. As long as you record it and you understand what the risks are, it can be managed. Of course, the other thing we need to understand is what is our grade distribution? Where, where are our important grade cutoffs in these resources? Are we dealing with gold and we know roughly where we're going to be in terms of a grade cutoff? Or are we dealing with, uh, you know, lithium? Are we dealing with iron ore? Or are we dealing with uh, gypsum with different things? You know, so we have to understand what the grade distribution is, no matter what it is. Here we've just got some examples out of uh, supervisor of you know being able to show your your grade distribution and DCF plot uh, sorry CDF plot um, across different domains. Make sure you understand what your population is doing after you've had your domaining discussion. Um, are all the samples in your near surface environment the same as your deeper samples? Are your deeper samples wet? Do they impact the way the statistical probabilities and the distribution of grade is managed? Again, there's no one right way to do it. You just have to look at it, you have to monitor it, and you have to be aware of it. And then, of course, you can get down to the detail of having, um, you know, quen scan type analysis where what's the distribution of the mineral within your samples? You know, if you're getting all of the, the mineralization in the dust in a very fine fraction, you can be blowing it away uh, if you don't have a dust collection system or a dust minimization system in an RC rig. Um, if you're drilling diamond, is it all very friable material that's your ore zone and it's getting washed away by the high pressure water as it's being drilled? 
uh, I've got lots of examples where that's happened. Um, do you need to use sonic drilling in order to minimise loss of sample into, say, a, 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 a waste dump or a dump or a tailing stand or you know, mat where material could be washed away easily? Air pressure from RC and water pressure from diamond can make a very significant difference and bias in the sample that you collect. So again, it's just all about test work to make sure that even if you think you're doing the right thing, that you are doing the right thing. What are you comparing with you know, your RC versus your diamond? Are you getting a variance between the two? Which one is more correct? Uh, you know, you're getting better sample through your RC because it's a larger sample, um, because it's a larger mass and you're splitting it proportionally and correctly, or is your diamond a better sample because your RC rig is uh, you know not able to uh, keep the air up at depth you know so all of these things have to be weighed up when we get to the assay lab we've got a whole different set of circumstances you know it's a lot more controlled uh, we hope um, you know, the sampling can be managed we can put in the protocols we can analyze the differences that we're getting across the systems the labs these days in general have pretty good systems, but you still got to ask the questions, go and visit the lab, get a relationship with the lab manager, go and walk in unexpectedly and say, I want to have a look around. Is there dust flying everywhere? Um, are they using appropriate devices to get you know, reasonable representativity of the sample throughout the process from you know, large sample into big bin at a course level or at a pulp level? putting it through a rotary splitter to make sure that you're splitting the sample accurately at a pulp level. All of these things aid in your likelihood of being able to get a representative sample. Um, I will divert just a little bit from physical sampling because it's relevant to the final resource estimate is, is how do we measure density because density just as any other assay is, is a very important component of our resource estimate. So how do we measure density? How do we estimate density? What are we using to define our density and how are we taking those samples? So the first question you have to ask is, what is the variability within your ore body? If you're dealing with a Western Australia, typical Western Australian and Archean gold, you can get a bit of variability between your, you know, your, your mafix and your felsix or your mafix and your ultra mafix and your quartz veins maybe, but Broadly speaking, they're not too bad, but as soon as you bring in massive sulphides or you know, even high, high levels of sulphur, you dramatically increase the variance uh, capable in your bulk density um, by the impact of the, the density of sulphur. So your pyrite rich ore bodies, you need to measure sulphur more often than not in order to get a good bulk density measurement uh, through a, a back calculation of a regression. Um, so we have to understand what elements and whether it's lithology or mineralization that makes a difference to your density variation. And you know, we can we can measure samples if if we like by sulfur against density, we get a very good correlation. In other places I've seen very poor correlation uh, just because there's multiple, ele multiple elements involved and multiple sampling techniques. So the best the advice uh, I can give you is that if we go back to our um, friend, Mr. Lipton, who lives next door to me here, and read his papers in, in, the, uh, in the handbook from the Oz IMM about different density methods, the best method is take a half core sample, measure that whole half core sample that's going to the assay lab for density, then you've got a direct assay to density calculation using Archimedes. Now, if there's a lot of porosity involved like we've got in nickel laterites, that's a lot more difficult. We may have to use whole core tray type uh, bulk density to uh, give a feeling for what the variance might be because you can get compaction of diamond core, you can get very easy to get core loss in these laterite profiles. So, you know, in reality, what you have to do is, is be smart about what samples you collect. Um, can you use geophysics downhole to help you with density? The, 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 I think 
in general terms, in my experience, downhole density can give you variable results. Obviously in coal, it's used extensively and reliably for seam picking, no problems at all. Um, but in, in most examples I've seen, it's very difficult to get a very good gamma gamma uh, to density because of moisture content porosity issues and having the tool against the actual hole they perfectly against the side of the hole on a regular basis so gamma tools you have to be very careful and watch out for okay a little bit of fun here get your brains working because I probably sent you to sleep already here we've got a sample it's on a, on a scale weighs half a kilogram okay bit of core and uh, we weighed it, we got a half gram. And then we put on a container with some water in it and the, the container with the water in it weighs 1.25 kilograms. We then suspend the core within the water and we measure the mass. What is that mass going to be? And answer in your head, because obviously I'm not there in person to uh, to pick a pick a person out. But in your head, what if that's a half a kilogram of core, and that's 1.25 kilograms of water? What is the answer going to be? Well, again, my good friend Mr. Lipton comes to the fore and tells us that if you use the water displacement method number five, and you divide the mass of the core by the mass of the core less the difference in the uh, weight measured versus the initial weight, uh, you end up with a value of 2.5 for your uh, in situ density, now on oh, your bulk density in this case. So why is that? And this is where your head always goes, how does that work? You've got a 1.25 kilograms of water and you're suspending it. Why was there any mass at all added? And it's all to do with the Archimedes principle, obviously, where the mass in, in the water exerts a pressure against the bottom of the container uh, because it's pushing it up in, in, in buoyancy. And uh, so you're actually effectively you know, losing water out over the edge, which is one of the other methods. So it's, it's quite a, a little bit of a head stuff around, but I just thought I'd throw that in to, uh, to make your brains work a little bit. All right, now, of course, sampling doesn't stop with sample uh, collection, sample preparation, but there's also the question of analysis because analysis, the, the size of the sample that you're analysing impacts that total, uh, that fundamental sampling error, total sampling error, TSE. So if you're analysing uh, your element of interest uh, in a HF four acid digest ICP methodology, you're generally taking somewhere around 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of a gram, a very small amount. You're taking an aquaregia digest, you're probably doing it somewhere between one and 10 grams. So it's already uh, an order of magnitude, more material being digested. You can then jump up to maybe fire assay golds and you'll get 25 to 50 grams in a fire assay, um, or you can jump up further to a screen fire assay, which is, it, it, you're taking a total sample of one kilogram, but you're then screening off what you think might be the coarse fraction which contains the potentially nuggety aspect of your sample and analysing all of that plus fraction and taking at least two repeats in the negative to estimate and back calculate what the total grade might be. You're not actually analysing the full one kilogram, you're actually analysing, let's say, 50 grams plus 50 grams plus whatever the plus size fraction is. So it's still, you know, maybe 100 grams, 120 grams. And then lastly, if you're using a, a, a partial digest, like a bulk leach extractable gold bleach sample using cyanide, you'll be using anything between 10 and four kilogram, 10 grams and four kilograms, depending on the mass of the, uh, the tub and the amount you want to pay. So that has a direct impact because the more, as I say, the more material you put into your analysis, the lower the sampling error might be. Practicality has to come to the fore. If your sampling theory says you've got to have to have a 50 kilogram sample to be representative, you have to be very careful because you're immediately getting into the grounds of 
or what are we going to do? We're going to have to take it to a commercial laboratory that's going to have to crush it to, uh, you know, a certain size that means that they're going to charge us three times what we normally charge in order to do it. So it can always be done. You can do it. You can crush it down and then representatively put it through one of those large uh, bin splitters that takes it out representatively. But you've got to have practicality. What is the what is the difference at the level of accuracy that you want for your mineral resource? How's my time going? Jeez, I better keep going. All right, innovation. Cold block, bang. One of the great new methods come out in, in a lot of areas, a lot of work done by CSIRO, high energy infrared uses, it digests these samples immediately. It's so quick, 15 minute digestion compared to most digestions, which take hours and hours. It eliminates perchloric, li limits the amount you need to use for HF. Look up cold block, it's going to be the next big thing for wet chemistry digestions. Uses this infrared and cools it at the collar. High energy XRF, very much on the way up as well. Non-destructive methodology, 500 grams of material, excellent for gold in high nugget environments. And you can you know, get a sample that you can repeat again and again and get the same assay. Very good technology. Um, we have on belt sampling, pulse fast thermal nuclear, uh, neutron activation. That will help you with measuring anything from moisture to gold grade, copper grade. Um, gold, not so much. Copper, pretty good. And all sorting, of course, is very much in the fore as well. So that's using that differences in sampling to uh, upgrade your material that you might be feeding to the mill. Uh, neat little one, X-ray tomography. If you actually get 3D um, analysis of where your element of interest is within your core, um, you know, our, whether it's in pyrite or arsenic pyrite, it can pick it and show you what your your, your trends might be in uh, in your core and use it to help you model your deposit. So, in conclusion, know your sample characteristics, know your grade distribution, understand what level of precision you want, and learn about new technology. Always keep your eyes open, and always, 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 always do QAQC. Thank you very much. Thank you.